All right, welcome to part two of the non-renewable energy notes. So we're going to start off with natural gas, right where we left off. Um, so we've already talked about how natural gases form. We said you normally see those little pockets above oil um, in those layers of rock underground. And what natural gas actually is, it's a mixture of um, a high percentage of methane, which is CH4. You have a carbon in the middle with hydrogens all around. Hydrogen... Okay, so it's cornered by H's, so it's got an H on each side, so you'd have an H here and an H here. CH4, that's methane. Um, and then it can contain smaller amounts of ethane, propane, butane, um, and hydrogen sulfide. Um, there's two different places you can get natural gas. So it says your conventional natural gas lies above most reservoirs of crude oil. Again, that's the one that I've shown you in the pictures. And then we can get unconventional deposits of gas um, that you, we might find within coal beds, within shale rock, uh, within sands. Um, and we can actually get to these areas in some pretty interesting ways, which I'll show you here in a little bit. Um, so, anyways, natural gas, it says it's used to generate electricity in the same way that other fossil fuels are. Um, it's also used in residences as fuel for cooking. Probably a lot of you guys um, have gas stovetops. Uh, heating, again, a lot of you probably have natural gas heating in your houses. Uh, water heaters, same thing. It's, it's very popular, I'd say, even, you know, especially in this area, too. With a lot of new houses and stuff, we have a lot of natural gas uh, in our houses. Okay, uh, we've got some different types of natural gas. So this is called um, compressed natural gas. It says it can be used as a fuel for vehicles, but because it must be transported by pipeline, it is not accessible to many places in the U.S. Um, and will therefore not be very useful for cars. Um, you can have liquefied petroleum gas, LPG. Uh, it says that this is a liquid version of natural gas. It can be transported via train or truck and stored in tanks. Um, a lot of times we see this type of gas in barbecue grills and heaters as well. Okay, we've already looked at this diagram earlier for um, oil drilling. So again, the way that we would most likely get at gas um, is to get to these compartments right above uh, your oil deposits and we're able to um, retrieve the gas that way. Okay, so we're going to get right into some pros and cons of natural gas. Um, a main one is that it is cheaper than oil. We've got much higher reserves of natural gas than we have of oil. It says that we have probably at least 125 years of natural gas left, um, so way more than oil. It's easily transported over land in pipelines, and again, we have a nice uh, extensive pipeline system. Uh, it has a high net energy yield. It has one of the greatest efficiencies because it's said to only lose about 10% of the original available energy um, during its processing. It produces less air pollution than your other fossil fuels um, as compared to oil and coal. Okay, uh, It produces less carbon dioxide than coal or oil. Extracting natural gas damages the environment much less than either coal or uranium. It's easier to process than oil. Uh, it can be used to transport vehicles, and it can be used in highly efficient fuel cells. Okay, and then here's a diagram. Again, a lot of these we've just heard. Uh, we've got a larger supply of natural gas than we do of oil. Good energy, net energy yield. Uh, again, low cost, but again, that's mostly due to large subsidies from the government. Um, less air pollution, lower CO2 emissions, moder oops, moderate environment uh, impact. Easily transported by way of the pipeline. Here's another little picture of your pipeline. Uh, low land use, um, good fuel for fuel cells and gas turbines. Disadvantages. It's still going to release some CO2 when burned. Ooh, and here's one of your big ones. Methane. So we talked about a big component of natural gas is methane. Methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas that you should remember from last unit. Um, it can leak from pipelines. Sometimes, we have this down here, um, where you have a natural gas well, sometimes they just burn it off. Um, and so that is not only releasing methane, but it's wasting stuff. Um, and the reason it's burned off is because, um, you know, it has such a low price and uh, there's burning off extra excess gas. Um, it can be shipped across the ocean as highly explosive um, 
liquid form. And that really, I wish I would have put that as one of the disadvantages too. Um, it can be, it can be, well, it's not difficult to transport, but again, it can be explosive. So you have to be cautious when you're transporting it. Okay, so these are the same things we just talked about. Um, here's another one that I forgot to add, fracking. So I believe that's coming up now. Okay, so I've got some really, really, really cool videos to show you on fracking, and I think the links of those are actually right here. Yeah. Um, so what I'll do when I post this um, note video, I'll post these links too, because these are really interesting and informative to watch along with this note video. And it does a good job of explaining fracking. So here it says, fracking is the process of drilling and opening up a rock that contains natural gas within the rock. Um, so what we have to do is we use these thumper trucks and we send down these little perforator things. Again, you'll see that in the video. Um, and these little perforators, we're going we're gonna to make these tunnels underground. And a lot of these tunnels actually run horizontally through these layers of rock. And um, these perforators, we give them a little jolt and it cracks the rock. And then we send water and sand and chemicals into the rock. And then eventually we'll suck all that stuff back out after we've given the water time to permeate through the rock. And it's going to bring up um, gas with it. So it's pretty cool technology. However, it's got a lot of controversy behind it. Um, it says we use large quantities of water to do this. Like I said, you're sending down water and chemicals to do uh, some of the fracturing and extraction of the gas. So that water becomes contaminated with chemicals and it has to be disposed of afterwards. Um, there have been accounts where supposedly during this process, because again, you're cracking through rock layers, that they believe that groundwater has been contaminated. Now you're going to see in the video, they take a lot of um, safety and precautionary actions while they're doing this process. But again, you have a lot of people worried because you're going through water tables and stuff that this stuff could seep out into uh, the groundwater, which would not be good. So again, we'll I'll have you watch these videos. They're really, really good. Okay, coal, onto our last fossil fuel. So coal, uh, we talked about how that's formed. Uh, we said it's mostly like from trees and ferns and swampy things. They're buried, decomposed, subjected to intense pressure and heat over millions of years. Uh, coal is mostly carbon. Uh, you have a small amount of water, sulfur, and other materials in coal as well. Uh, there are three types of coal. You have lignite, which is brown coal, bituminous coal, which is soft coal, and anthracite, which is hard coal. Um, we're going to look at a diagram on the next slide. It's a very important diagram. Um, I want you guys to co copy down as much as you can on your notes with this. So you can pause it if you want. Um, but you do need to know about these different types of coal. So it says the carbon content increases as the coal ages, and the heat content also increases with carbon content. Okay, um, basically, if we look at this diagram, this is like the least valuable coal, and this is like the most wanted, the most valuable coal. So let's go from left to right. And notice as we're going from left to right, we have more moisture in this stuff, less moisture down here, and the more desirable stuff. Uh, we also have more heat and more carbon in this more desirable stuff. Um, so peat is actually not considered a coal. It says it's a partially decayed plant matter from swamps and bogs. In some countries, especially developing countries, they would burn it um, and it would generate a little bit of heat. Okay, so as it shows here, as we go through more heat and pressure, we, had, we would have developed the lignite, the brown coal. Uh, this stuff has low heat content, low sulfur content, limited supplies in most areas. Uh, you can find a lot of this out west in our country. Um, people like it, though, because it does have a low sulfur content, so it will burn cleaner. Okay, then we come down to the next one. Here's your bituminous coal, which is known as soft coal. Uh, it says it's extensively used as a fuel because of its high heat content and large supplies. Uh, it normally has a high sulfur content, um, and you can find this a lot in the Appalachian region, the Mississippi Valley, Central Texas, and the Great Lakes. So we do use a lot of bituminous coal. And then anthracite is your hardest coal formed through the most heat and pressure. It says it's highly desirable because it's, it's high heat content and it also has low sulfur. Um, supplies are limited in most areas. We mostly find this in Pennsylvania, so that's why you have all the coal mines up there. 
Okay, um, we've already talked about this. This is just a quick review uh, ways to get coal. You could do subsurface mining, which is underground one, which we know is the most dangerous type because you can have different types of accidents and uh, miners can get black lung disease. Um, there's different types of surface mining. You can have different types of strip mining. You can have the open pit mining, like the quarry stuff. Uh, but again, that's all review from last chapter. Okay, and this picture, again, we're revisiting it one more time. Here we see different ways to get at coal. Um, you can do your subsurface underground mining here. Here's different types of strip mining on the surface of the ground. Okay, why do we need coal? Um, well, we know it's a type of fossil fuel, so it does generate um, energy and electricity. So it says coal provides 25% of the world's commercial energy, only 22% in the U.S. because we know we mostly use oil. Um, it's used to make 75% of the world's steel, and it generates 64% of the world's electricity. Okay, um, yeah, so this little cartoon talks about how we can use coal to make steel. So that's something that a lot of people, um, or I should say a lot of students, don't really know before we talk about coal, is it is used to produce steel. And these are all the different things that we can uh, use coal for. So lots of different products, um, kind of like oil, how we can make lots of things from oil. Okay, so the world's coal supplies, um, it says that the U.S. has 66% 66, uh, 66 of the world's proven reserves. Now, we have a lot of coal left. So here it says uh, identified reserves should last 220 years at current usage rates, and unidentified reserves could last about 900 years. So with this being said, you're probably like, well, we got plenty of fossil fuels to last us, you know, as long as we need. And that may be the case, but coal is very unattractive. Um, we've talked about it a lot already. It's very dirty, has lots of sulfur in it. Some people are saying we can find a way to make coal cleaner and, you know, turn into different types of fuel sources, then maybe coal will be the answer to the future. But according to that graph I showed you earlier, it's more likely going to be um, natural gas and other renewable stuff. Okay, so for now, your largest coal reserves are found in the U.S., Russia, China, and then India. Uh, and those are in order. And the largest producers of coal right now, China is beating us. Uh, they produce more than us. Uh, we're second place, India and Australia. Okay, pros and cons of solid coal. <laughs> Advantage, we only have one thing here. This is actually kind of a funny list. Uh, it says it's the world most abundant fossil fuel, uh, added in dirtiest there too, um, which is not an advantage. Uh, and it does have a high net energy yield. Okay, and here's our uh, advantage versus disadvantage picture. Again, ample supplies. It's really one of the best things you can say about it. We've got a lot of it on the planet. Uh, high net energy yield, low cost, again, due to subsidies. Disadvantages. You're going to find on the next slide I have a million disadvantages, but here's some of them. Uh, high environmental impact to mine them out of the ground. Here we see some of the pictures of the strip mining and the um, subsurface mining. Severe land disturbance, air pollution, water pollution, high land use. Uh, severe threat to human health. Gives off a lot of bad pollutants. It actually, when you uh, burn coal, it gives off mercury too. So lots of bad things coming from coal. Uh, high carbon dioxide emissions. Releases radioactive particles. And there's that mercury I just mentioned into the air. So burning coal is not good. Okay, here's some other things. Let me see if I can roll this up roll up. Okay, uh, to get the coal, to do the mining, it's dangerous, uh, harms the land, we already said that. It can cause subsidence in the land doing all the mining. Um, mining causing lots of land disturbance, we've already said that. Uh, cannot be used in uh, solid forms in cars. Okay, it have to be converted to a liquid or a gaseous type. Now let me see if I can turn this back to an arrow, sorry. Here we go. I want to move this over just a little bit. There we go. Okay, um, it's the dirtiest fossil fuel to burn. There's a list of all the different chemicals that are given off. Uh, it releases particulates and ashes into the air. Toxic metals, mercury, lead, arsenic, radioactive elements. Um, it says burning coal releases thousands of times more radioactive particles into the atmosphere per unit of energy than does a nuclear power plant. Hmm, interesting. Produces more carbon dioxide, uh, and it's a severe threat to human health, uh, lots of respiratory diseases. Okay, so some alternatives to using regular solid coal are some of these cl 
clean coal technologies. Uh, the first one we have here is fluidized bed combustion. Um, it says it's a way that's been developed to burn coal more cleanly and efficiently. So basically what they do here, and I think I have a picture of this. Yes. Okay, so when you are getting ready to burn your coal, the coal is um, pulverized and it's mixed with a pulverized limestone. Um, and the limestone is going to help to neutralize the coal. Um, the limestone is actually considered like a sulfur absorbing chemical. Okay, so when you burn the coal and it's been kind of meshed with this uh, neutralizer, you should be able to capture most of the sulfur pollutants. Um, so I found a percentage somewhere, I think it said like 95% of the sulfurous emissions are captured before the emissions are actually released. So that's pretty cool. That's a way to more cleanly burn coal. Uh, you could use lower sulfur coal to begin with. There is lower sulfur coal or you can um, modify the coal that you're burning. You can change the coal into a gas. Um, this is called, uh, you'd call it synthetic natural gas from the coal. Or you can uh, turn coal into a liquid. So it says produce a liquid fuel uh, like methanol or synthetic gasoline from coal as well. And it says because the U.S. has so much coal, uh, these technologies offer potentials to eliminate U.S. dependence on foreign oil since we can make gaseous and liquid um, fuels from coal. However, these processes require a lot of energy and they're expensive. So, you know, they may not be very sustainable. They may not be very self-sufficient strategies to get fuels from coal. Uh, and then this is the gasification process. It just shows uh, taking raw coal, pulverizing it, um, putting it in this condenser thing, and that's going to do a chemical reaction to change it into methane, your natural gas. Okay, and here's your product. You're going to get clean methane gas at the end. Okay, so these clean coal technologies, advantages of them, uh, again, we have a large potential supply of coal. Uh, when we change coal into liquids, gases, we could use it for vehicle fuel. Uh, disadvantages is because it takes so much processing, you'd have a low to moderate net energy yield, um, higher cost than regular coal, higher environmental impact, increased mining, because now we're using more coal, high water use, and higher CO2 emissions. Sin fuels. Uh, these are liquids that can be obtained from coal, natural gas, oil share, shale, or biomass. Uh, these can be transported by uh, pipelines inexpensively. They can be burned to produce electricity. They can be burned to eat houses and water, used for vehicles. Um, so again, getting oils and gases from other um, sources. Okay, so here's one of these uh, oil shales. And so what these are, um, if you guys have taken earth science, you know what shale rock is. So it says they're tight source rock. So shale is going to be really kind of tightly compacted rock. They're in little thin layers. Uh, it says that they are not permeable enough to pump oil out of these rocks. But we can use technologies to fracture them and ignite the shale. And that will cause uh, the oil to migrate out of that rock to a pumping station. Uh, it says, however, only a small amount of oil has been recovered in pilot studies. Um, so it's still kind of in, I guess, not clinical trials, but they're in pilot trials right now. Um, it's said that we could meet US crude oil demand for 40 years at current usage rates. Um, supposedly, we've got a lot of these oil shells out in Colorado, Utah, Wyoming. Um, so that's, that's a possibility. This is a, that's one of those types of things that requires a lot of processing, similar um, to the fracking stuff. And then here are these tar sands. This is very interesting. This is something that's very controversial in the environmental world right now. Um, tar sands, what they are, they're a mixture of clay, sand, and water. They contain this um, source that's called bitumen, which is it's a high sulfur heavy oil. Um, they're too thick and viscous to flow. That means, um, you know, it's, it's very, I don't want to say it's solid-like, but it doesn't have very good flow to it. Um, so the way we'd have to get that from the ground, it says that it's extracted by injecting hot steam, which heats the sands and makes the tar less viscous so it can be pumped out. Uh, because generating steam consumes lots of energy, this is only economical when oil prices are very high. Now, 
we've got these tar sands in Canada, in Alberta, Canada. We have the largest area of these tar sands. And the more I talk about tar, the more I realize that's an easy description to think of what we mean by not very viscous, really kind of heavy and non-flowing like tar. Um, so anyways, we've got all these tar sands in Canada. Um, we have this thing called the Keystone Pipeline, but we want to change the direction um, and extend the Keystone Pipeline. So let me show you a picture of this. We currently have a pipeline that goes up here from Canada down here into the States a little ways. However, you've probably even seen commercials about this on TV. We want to extend and expand this pipeline to go all the way from up here all the way down to the Gulf in Texas, okay? And it'll make stops along the way, and we can um, get the fuel uh, in various parts of the country, okay? Now, the problem we're going to see, and I don't know if I have a good picture of the aquifer. No, I don't think I do. Let me look here real quick. Nope. Darn. I have one on some of our next slides. Um, we have a very, very, very important aquifer that exists out west, okay? And when this new pipeline rolls on through here, the worry is that this pipeline is going to come over top of this enormous aquifer. It's called the Ogallala Aquifer. We'll talk about more about this in the uh, water unit. And if there is ever any sort of leak in the pipeline, that oil would seep into the ground, which we know that the ground, well, you have your tar sands up here, but the Ogallala Aquifer also has very, very sandy soil. And what we should remember about sandy soil, it has a very high permeability. So any oil that leaks out of this pipeline would seep right into the soil, and they're worried it would go right down to the aquifer and contaminate uh, that aquifer, which would contaminate water. So... That's what this is talking about. It says uh, production of these tar sands in Canada has increased rapidly in recent years, um, which brings us to that Keystone Pipeline case study. How will that affect the Ogallala Aquifer, which is the largest um, water aquifer in the world, and now they want to send this pipeline right over top of it. So again, that's a very, very um, current case study. Okay, and let me see if there's anything else that I wanted to say about that. Okay, just, yeah, that the water from the aquifer is used for a whole bunch of crops out in the Midwest. It's used for drinking water. So any leakage of that um, oil could possibly get into the aquifer and it would cause um, big problems for, for any water usage. Okay, and so these are these, um, the oil shales and then um, tar sands is kind of a similar idea. Okay, and then I'm just going to kind of roll through this. This just shows um, the processing that oil shale would go through. You do have to inject air uh, down into the shale to help extract the oil. So then you pump the oil out. You remove impurities. You add hydrogen. Um, and it has to be refined before you can send it off. And this is the uh, same idea with the tar sands. Um, Here's all the processing that you have to do for it. Uh, once you extract it, you heat it up, uh, remove your impurities, add hydrogen, um, it becomes synthetic crude oil, and then send it to the refinery. Okay, here's a picture of some of these tar sands up here in Canada. Okay. And some pros and cons for these is that there's a moderate existing supply, um, large potential supplies. Disadvantages are uh, it costs a lot of money, very expensive. Because of all the processing, it's actually a low net energy, um, large amount of water needed for the processing, severe land disruption, lots of water pollution from all the mining, air pollution when burned, and CO2 emissions when burned. And that is it. So we are done with non-renewable energy. Next will be renewable energy and nuclear power.